become the security alarm instructor. Okay, so we're go. Okay, so we're going to do a PowerPoint presentation, and I'm going to do a lesson on the elements of security. Um, so if you have issues looking at that, or you find it's difficult, um, you can either turn your chair or move back or whatever works for you. Um, so as Kathy had told you, this is part of my capstone project. Um, and that's going to be kind of my bridge in, is to talk about my capstone project. So um, I'm in the process of getting my provincial instructor diploma, and this is the last thing I have to do in order to complete that. Um, so my name is Michael Feldner. Um, I'll be your instructor for this lesson. Um, I'm a trades qualified security installer. I've uh, got my qualification in 1992, a long time ago. Um, I also have an RB203 in 1990, that's the uh, restricted B electrical ticket up to 750 volts. Um, if you guys have done your wiring in the back for the transformer, it's basically, it allows you to do wiring from an enclosure to a receptacle or to a box that allows you to install a transformer for communication and security. Um, I also have a uh, Red Seal Carpenter certificate, so I'm a carpenter as well. And uh, I'm also working on my um, industrial electrician ticket, so I can write my industrial electrician ticket, but I've been spending my time doing this instead. Um, I've worked for um, Peter Moore, Moore Security. I've worked for Paladin Security. I'm sure you've seen Paladin Security guards walking around here. Um, I also worked for the uh, province of BC liquor distribution branch. So that was uh, I was responsible for technical security at 54 liquor stores. So that was um, alarms, access, um, a lot of computer wiring, telecommunications wiring, general troubleshooting of any of their electrical systems and maintenance. So I used to travel the whole province and go basically from Prince George North to do whatever they needed to do. Um, they didn't use anything commercially available locally. It was all sourced out of the United Kingdom. It was a totally different type of uh, security system. But uh, nonetheless, uh, the basic principles are all the same. So the learning outcomes for today are going to be, um, you're going to, you should be able to describe the principles of security. Um, the principles of security are divided into two groups. One is the elements of security, and uh, we're going to call that rapid, and that'll make some more meaning as we go through it. And then the other one is the layering of security, also known as the uh, onion skin. And the little kind of term I've used for that is psst. You know when you have people making noise and you go psst. So this is a little thing to remember. And that's P-P-I-S-P. -P -P. Um, have any of you heard of the elements of security before? Oh, okay. Um, so you've heard about the principles. Have you heard about the elements of security before? No? Okay. No, no. Um, what prior knowledge do you have regarding the planning of security systems? Have you guys had any experience with planning security systems? I have. Have you? Okay. So, so the gentleman in the back has had some experience. That's wonderful. Um, has anybody worked in the security industry or is anybody currently working in the security industry? You are working? I was, and then I came to school here. Oh, okay. What were you doing? Um, I was kind of a technician's helper. For okay. Oh, excellent. So so you've had quite a bit of hands-on experience and you've done it for a year. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And, and you obviously enjoyed it? Yeah. Okay. And, and, and you know what? I mean, in, in many ways, um, security is a great trade. There's a lot to know. There's a lot to always stay up on. Um, certain things stay the same. And then in other ways, things are constantly changing. Um, technologies are changing. Um, so the two points I wanted to make were rapid, and, and just to give you an example of what an element of security would be, so prevention would be an element of security. So in, in many ways, one of the best security systems is the one that never goes off, 
because you've done such a good job of prevention. Okay? Um, so I've already gone over rapid, I've gone over the, the onion skin and the psst. And, and the reason I'm using psst is because it's going to be easy to remember and it's going to be easy to prompt you to kind of understand how these work. Um, so during the planning stages, you really have to kind of look at each installation slightly different and analyze what are the aspects that I need to kind of consider. So you want to be able to look at the five elements of, of security and kind of implement as many of them as you can. So those are deterrents. And as I said, the best security system never goes off because you've done such a good job of deterring them. Um, so examples of deterrents are lawn signs, um, window stickers, stickers on the door, um, things that don't invite the opportunity. So in other words, if you leave your car doors unlocked and some guy walks down the street and tries all the door handles, that's not a very good deterrent, is it, if your car is unlocked? You're kind of inviting it. So you want to operate in a way where you're deterring people, you're saying, don't come to my house, don't come to my business, go down the road. Um, other things are like window bars, um, good locks, um, you know, or more than one lock, things like that. Um, the second element is prevention. Uh, you want to physically stop or slow down intruders. And that can be something as simple as, you know, just keep your doors locked. Um, depending on the application, sometimes you have window bars. Um, so if you look at like a Home Depot, for example, or, or like a Visions Electronics is a great example where they have those big bollards in front of the doors, so you can't just drive a car right through the door. Um, so that's a preventative measure to prevent kind of crashing grabs or, or things like that. Um, another deterrent, I don't know if you guys have seen the video on it, is security window film. Have you guys seen the video of the demonstration of how security window film works? Where they take an ax and they chop through the window and it takes the guy about 20 minutes to actually get completely through the window because he actually has to chop the whole thing completely out. Um, so that's a great deterrent. Um, you're having to buy a new window and having to get new window film, but it, it's a great preventative measure because it takes so long to get in. Um, and then of course, if you do end up with an incident where your security system has been violated, you want to detect it. So if you want to, you want to detect somebody getting in the building, um, the best way to do that is with your perimeter, if they've broken a window, open the window, broken a door, open a door, you've detected with a magnetic switch, a motion detector, a glass break detector, um, in some instances a pressure mat. Um, I do a lot of uh, security with uh, really high-end yachts, and because yachts are such a kind of anomalous way to do security, it's something that's out in the open, but nobody's supposed to be on it. It's not like somebody's going to go in your backyard to you know, check your hydrometer. A boat, if you have a, a pressure mat on the deck, some guy climbs on your boat, steps in the back, the alarm goes, because you're in the confined space of the boat. Um, and then response. So there's been an alarm. We need to respond. How do you respond and how do you effectively respond? Um, so you have sirens, you have strobe lights. Um, in the liquor stores, what we used to do is we used to have a relay connected to the whole lights of the entire building and the entire building would flash. And um, the newer lights are a bit better, but if you flash fluorescent lights a hundred times, you'll actually find you'll burn all the ballast out. <laughs> <laughs> we went about through three or four liquor stores where we burned all the lights out because they kept getting broken into so many times. It was a great system. It worked great. It was really amazing to see all the lights in the building flashing. Um, it really does stand out, but um, you also have to be aware that there are some considerations when you're doing that. And then, of course, the, the um, 
kind of mainstay of our business is the monitoring station and how the monitoring station responds. If you have a good monitoring station and also how aware your customers are with the kind of um, monitoring station interface. So in other words, you have to educate your customers that it's their responsibility to communicate with the station and have a protocol for how they want to deal with it. In most instances, it's a call to the police or the fire department or the ambulance, depending on the signals you're sending. Um, and then of course, when we do have a breach, we want to catch the bad guys. Um, and how do we catch the bad guys? Well, we either have video surveillance of them, we have timely response, so the uh, monitoring station catches them, they dispatch the police, and you have um, the alarm logs. So when you have an event, your alarm panel will open each time a door opens, what zones faulted, when it went into alarm, if it was turned off, who turned it off, all those type of things. And then we have um, a printout from that. So in some instances, you can download that log and print it out. And then in some instances, you can also, if it's a monitor system, you can have the central station print out a log. And a lot of times, insurance companies will want to have that to confirm that the system is properly set, to confirm that the system reported properly, and that you as a technician did your job properly. And that would be rapid. So they're not in order, but it makes it easy to remember. So if you think in terms of rapid, it's response, apprehension, prevention, detection, and deterrence, or deterrence and detection. Um, the eye is silent. But I, I, I just thought that this would be a good way for you guys to remember how to remember the five elements. So now we have the onion skin principle. Um, before I go any further, do you guys have any questions? No, we're good? Yeah. Okay. So the onion skin principle, or the principle of layering, is um, it's done basically so that if one layer of your security fails, you have a backup, or a backup to the backup. So as a general rule, um, you have, um, and this is actually a concept that um, Mike and Peter developed was the pre-perimeter. So the pre-perimeter is before your perimeter, so an example would be your front yard. So you have a house, you have a front yard, and your pre-perimeter would be um, your boulevard. So you live in a busy neighborhood and there's been some things going on in your neighborhood and you want to make sure that you're aware that somebody's coming to your front yard. Um, a pre-perimeter device would be like a motion detector light. So somebody comes into your front yard, the motion detector light goes on, that turns on multiple lights, lights up the area. Um, in certain circumstances, you can be made aware of that. Um, in other instances, other people would be made aware of it because we all respond to lights turning on and lights turning off and all the rest of it. Um, there are also kind of um, warning systems. You could have that motion detector because it's based on a detection of a human. Um, so the light goes on, the detector trips because the light went on or because somebody came into the area and that could trip a warning. So you could have a little beeper or a light or, or a variety of things to kind of warn you. Um, the thing about that is because it's not necessarily an alarm, it's just a pre-warning, you don't want these to cause an alarm to the central station, or you don't want your security system to go into alarm, right? You just want to, so, so, uh, so you, have you guys done the chime feature on the keypad yet? So if you look at these keypads, they all have a chime feature. And the chime feature is um, when the system's not armed and somebody opens a door, the keypad just beeps. Mm -hmm. So that would be an, a good example of what a pre-perimeter is. Even though you're using it in the perimeter, it's just a warning to say, you know, um, my child opened the door, or somebody's come in. I, I'm not in a 
armed situation where I'm trying to protect myself. I'm just trying to warn myself that somebody's trying to kind of come into my area. And as a general rule, people know when they're in a place they're not supposed to be. Um, you just want to deter and scare people off. Um, so a couple of notes on the pre-perimeter, and that is that uh, they should never activate a full alarm condition just because of the, you don't want false alarms. Um, examples would include photoelectric beams, outdoor PIRs, um, fence protection, and I think one of the most common ones is motion detector lights. Everybody's seen motion detector lights. Um, there's also a couple of other technologies called uh, capacitance detection and geofencing. So capacitance detection, um, does anybody here have a car alarm on their car? Does anybody have a car? Um, have you ever seen those car alarms where when you get close to the car, the thing starts beeping? Have, are you guys familiar with those? So capacitance detection is the human body, um, sort of like a magnet, emanates a certain amount of capacitance, and that can be detected. So there's a company out of the States called uh, Senstar Fence Systems, and they can actually have a cable that they bury in the ground, and what it does is it um, just detects the general amount of capacitance in the area, and then when that capacitance changes, it sets off an alarm. So one of the things I used to do is I used to service these systems for BC Hydro. So BC Hydro, um, they used to have a lot of theft from their trucks of the copper wiring. Copper is very expensive, very sought after, very easy to get rid of, and I mean, if you could carry 100 pounds of copper, you could take it to the recycler and get $500 for copper. So they were having such a problem with it, they designed a parking lot for their trucks in their yard. It was all fenced off, and they would actually park their trucks in designated spots right over top of the detection system, and they'd come in, stop the truck, shut the yard down for the end of the night, arm the system, and then if somebody came in to that area and even stood near the truck, the alarm would go. And it was really interesting technology. Um, the uh, prison systems use it for their fence perimeters. They use it as a warning system to see if somebody's trying to get in or get out. Um, very, very sophisticated, very high-end. Um, you're not going to see those kind of systems when you're dealing with a residential application unless it's a really high-end application. But still something to be aware of. Uh, geofencing is another type of detection where it's using a, um, either a DSC, which is a, a digital communication system. Your cell phones have that, and that's how your cell phones um, use uh, GPS. So when you're driving your car and the uh, map on the phone is moving, that's because the cell towers are triangulating your position. So for an example, if I had geofencing on my cell phone and I said my cell phone is supposed to be right there, and what it does is it locates it wherever it is in space, and then when it's moved, out of its location, well, it's moved out of its geofence. So in other words, if I sit there and say, my phone is supposed to be in that location, and I go and I move it from this location to that location, it's no longer in the fenced area, and that can trigger an alarm. Hmm. <clears throat> Depending on the system, um, it can also tell you where it went. So I um, worked with another guy sometimes, he works with NAVSAT Canada, and uh, he had his boat stolen. So he had this really fancy cigarette boat, and um, I guess he was up in Kelowna having a good time with his family, and he came out in the morning and his boat was gone. So he was so upset about it, he decided to build and design his own locating system for his boat. So he went and designed a um, geofencing, cell reporting, GPS tracking security system that you can install in boats that if the boat gets stolen because it left the geofence, it will actually report back and tell you its location every half an hour or every 20 minutes. 
and you can, like any kind of programming, you can determine where that goes. Um, then we get to, yes? What's the photoelectric beam? Uh, so, so are you familiar with a passive infrared beam? Okay, so, so up on the wall here we have what, what are called passive infrared beams. So a passive infrared, great question by the way. Um, so a passive infrared beam, the reason it says passive is because it doesn't actually do anything. So a passive infrared beam will have a set of fingers that look out just like your eye. Perfect example of it is your eye. So as an example, a motion detector, if you hold your hand like this and you look out your eye and you see the pattern of what you see, um, the motion detector looks at that pattern and says, okay, I'm looking at the cupboard, I see two doors, two drawers, two shelves, and a piece of wood. When that changes, the color, the texture, and the temperature of all those things change. So in other words, um, the ambient temperature of my body is different than the temperature of the wood. Do you guys all understand that? Okay, so I'm 98.6 degrees. I think my skin temperature is 78.5 or something like that. That's probably 70 degrees. The motion detector will detect the difference in temperature. Um, an IR beam is an infrared beam. So an infrared beam, um, have you ever gone into a store and you walked into the store and the store chimed? Okay, so that's an active infrared beam. So that has a transmitter at one end and then a receiver at the other. And it sends a beam directly through to the receiver. When that beam gets broken, even for a second, the receiver detects that, trips a relay, says to the chime, or even the alarm system, I've had a break, that's an alarm. Um, <coughs> We use a lot of IR beams in boat installations. And the reason we use them is they're very reliable and they definitely transmit and protect a very specific area. Um, so when we talk about spot protection later on, that's where IR beams become um, really important. So in other words, here, I'll use my cell phone again. So if I have 